Welcome to High Point University's premier life skills seminar featuring HPU's in-residence leaders and other global change agents. Welcome, sir. Okay. All right, not one to be shy. I'm gonna start with a controversial question. I don't think schools are necessarily designed for kids. We have kids out there that break the mold. And as a former middle school teacher, I loved teaching those students. What should schools be doing for these brilliant children that are not fitting in this mold that we call school, that are sending our budgets through I, the roof and, and Largely based breaking on my rules. own experiences, I think about that all the time. Now, I wanted to be two things in life. I told my father when I was in sixth grade, I want to be an engineer first, electrical engineer like you. And I said, second, I want to be a fifth grade teacher, like my teacher that had, wow. you know, sometimes some teachers just respect you so much and mean so much. And I had such strong education values. That was how you were going to have a life and someday have an income and have a home and a family and it was really starting in education, and uh, uh, I had strong values. So being a teacher is very important to me. Now, I did some teaching all my life. I wanted to teach fifth grade, if I could. Uh, after 10 years, Apple had gone, been real successful. I went back to college to get my, um, my to finish my last year of college. And I went back as a psych major, because that was closer to education. Mm -hmm. And this was at Berkeley, and you'd go under fake name, because my name was famous. So the name on my Berkeley diploma says Rocky Raccoon Clark. <laughs> that was the name I chose. And, um, and, and I'll tell you, I wanted to study things about the mind and how it relates to education, how it compares to computers. And what I found very intense, I was so motivated to understanding certain things that uh, we don't know how the mind is wired. You know, we know circuits and we can unplug it, test signals and modify something, find a problem and fix it. Can't do that in the mind. Where is the memory stored? Where are your memories stored? Where in the body? Anybody have an idea? People say in the brain. Well, the processing centers are certainly in the brain. That makes sense that the memories would be there, but we can't ever unravel the brain and identify. Here's the memory for the word corn. We found it. You know, here's a memory for the word horn over here. No, we can't do that. We just sort of um, never know where memories are. I read every book there is to this day on memories and tests. Yes, you can probe individual neurons and they get excited at certain pictures. Wait a minute, that just means they're in the processing center for that type of picture. And uh, everybody's trying to make a brain in, in electronics. In technology companies, IBM has synapse chips. If we, if we program synapses, uh, we, can, we can actually put hardware together and make a brain. I was at a company once where the engineers figured out how to make a brain. Takes nine months. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for memory, the, big, the best theory about memory is we don't know where it is in the brain. We can't identify anything, so it's holographic theory. It's everywhere. Pull, pull out part of a rat's cortex, it remembers the maze. Pull out another part, it remembers the maze. Take out the entire cortex and it forgets the maze. That's like saying we don't know where it is. Um, and I came up with the strongest correlation in any book, on mem any book on memory to this day. And of course, I was trying to make fun of the fact that we don't really know where memories are or what they are. So my joke was there's a correlation to something we know is not memories. You lose two things between the ages of six and 10 years old. You lose your childhood autobiographic memories, things that happen, and you lose your teeth. Think about that. It's a stronger statement than any correlation, any book on memory. And we know memories are not in teeth. It's 2024. If you go and use a search engine, I don't use the G word, you use a search engine <laughs> and you look up teeth memories, you're going to be shocked at what you find and what they say. And the tests for Alzheimer's are in saliva and the gums. So. I don't know, there could be some little truth to it, but I was just trying to make fun of the, the books and we pretend we know things that we don't know. So, uh, um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's where it was. Anyway, I, and I eventually I did become a teacher. Yeah, eventually, uh, I mean, um, I'd wanted all my life to do it and I started teaching. It started with Elena. Now this is more, um, 
this is a direct example, a direct story. A girl that we knew in fourth grade and knew her very closely to our family, and her mother said, said that she had stopped studying. She just didn't care. She wasn't doing any homework or anything. I thought, I wonder if I could be a part of a solution. And back then, no kids had computers. They were so expensive, they cost about as much as a car, and no kid had a computer. I said, I'll take a computer over to her house. And we bolted together this computer. There were no laptops yet. Put this computer together and taught her where the <coughs> memories, when things were. It took a long time just to set it up. And then there was a paper due. So they had to write a story, make up a story. And we worked together and came up with a story idea. And then somebody who's never typed, back in those days, there was no typing, there were no keyboards, has to hunt and peck letter by letter by letter. It took two hours to write a one-page story. You know, you would have written it in less than 20 minutes by hand, maybe. And uh, she started, we started doing that day after day after day for a couple of weeks. And she really liked the fact that she was turning in printed out homework from a computer. In other words, the specialness motivated her. And somehow, usually it doesn't happen at this old age, fourth grade. Usually it's second grade where you've lost them forever. And she came back in and she became a good student. And by the time she got to college, um, Long Beach State University, she got on the dean's list every quarter. So uh, she really, really brought her back in. After that experience, I thought, whoa, I wonder if there's other kids that I could kind of save you know, in, with computers, being unusual technology of the day, personal computers. And I start, that summer I taught six kids. I, we lived in the Santa Cruz Mountain area. There was a little public school with only one classroom per grade. And I took the, uh, I'd always wanted to teach fifth grade, so I took the, some fifth graders, some about to be in the fifth grade, six of them for one summer. Wow, and I didn't know what I'm gonna teach, how to use the computer for all the subjects in life and made it a ton of fun and that uh, motivated, the motivation was the most important thing of all. One thing I learned, it's less important that knowledge is coming from your mouth as a teacher. It's more important that you get students motivated wanting to learn. If a student wants to learn, they're gonna find the way to get information about the subject. Now we have the internet, then we didn't. Um, but that was the more important. Motivation is more important than knowledge even. And uh, it kind of fits my own life. Almost everything I did that was great, out of the box in technology, I hadn't trained on it, I hadn't practiced it, I hadn't done it before. It wasn't repeated from a class or a book. It was, oh my gosh, I've never used this kind of part before. How would I best configure it? And my brain always sought the absolute minimal best configurations. I don't know. I, I, I do know how I grew up that way, but um, that's another story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we had our classes and and it was very, very successful. And then for every year, I took the entire fifth grade from this one school. All the students were in a class. Sometimes it was at the school, after school, certain, certain hours after the days. It was all voluntary, but every single student did it. And then sometimes it was in my office in town. Sometimes it was even in my own garage. Mm -hmm. And I taught no press allowed, eight years of it, full time. I was working full time, morning to evening, uh, most important thing in my life, even seven days a week at one point, because I had multiple groups of classes. I, I love that you talked about teaching skills, teaching motivation, because one of the things that I'm interested in as the dean of the School of Education is how the role of teachers is changing. So one generation ago, teachers were the purveyor of information. You went to your teacher to get the knowledge that you needed to pass your class. You had a textbook that was an ancillary resource. Now students get their information from TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. They don't need teachers for information. They need teachers for other things. And so as a dean of the School of Education, I ask myself, what do we need to be teaching in our classes to help reshape the role of the teacher into one that teaches students how to be motivated to learn, or how to not demotivate them to learn in a classroom, but how to keep them motivated, how to keep them engaged, how to think that, how to keep them thinking. And I wanted to know from you, our innovator in residence, you know, how do we innovate the role of the teacher? How do we stay relevant as teachers and prepare teachers to be relevant in the future to support this new age of learning? Yeah, it's not exactly like there's a science. I mean, if you're gonna be a teacher, you had better want to help people in the world. 
I was a very unusual teacher because I was voluntary. And I didn't have to go by, you know, the kids came out, they all want to learn. Everybody wants to learn new things, especially when computers were so new. And um, the trouble is, you get to school, your first day in school, you want to see what's in the drawers. Oh, no, no, you can't. There are 30 kids in here. They can't, that's way too many. Uh, what I found was 17 was a lot easier to teach than 30. Um, you do get to know each student's level and where they're at and ask them the right questions. But uh, they want to know things about what's going on. And every kid kind of has a different direction in life that maybe they're good at and they want to go in this direction. It might even be just sports for some of them. But um, no, all everybody has to learn the same thing in schools. The system already sets down rules that inhibit innovation, thinking out differently about different things. You just have to be do the exact same things, exact same pages in the same chapters, and then take tests. You know, and the trouble is by second grade, there's Johnny's always got the answers, and you just feel dumb if you're not Johnny. You feel like I'm a little behind. And most teachers will tell you by eight years old, the teachers, the students decide they're giving up on education. It's not important to them. And you think, well, it'll get revived in third grade with another teacher. It doesn't. And it doesn't get revived in fourth grade. It's fifth. They pretty much that early needs a lot of attention. Don't lose kids. You want to help them through life. You know, be their best friend. Um, a teacher is used to be academic information. Now even a computer is just a modern form of a textbook. It's not emotional. It's not like a teacher who's a friend. It's not like your best friend saying, Oh, making something interesting, like in that movie Radical, you know, and letting you think for yourself and come up with your own solutions. Um, so uh, how do you get around that? I mean, if, if a teacher teaches a course one, one day, one of the chapter in the book, and somehow it didn't go over, some part of it didn't go over, maybe the students were all, all excited about some skating trip they'd been on, and it didn't, they didn't quite get it. Can the teacher go back the second day and reteach it better? No. Principal says, sorry, you have to be on these pages in the book on these days. Mm -hmm. There's a strict schedule set down. That is just anti-innovation, anti-teaching you know, thinking, and anti being teaching somebody to be smart. Um, you should be able to uh, just be flexible and say they want to learn. You want them to get it till they learn. And I had cases like the, that in my own class, and I was voluntary. I could go back and spend another day teaching maybe sorting algorithms, sorting numbers or whatever, teach it a different way to try to get it across. Um, you have to, you know, a teacher can think these things out and see what's real, and even AI just really can't, just sort of has its taught pro concepts, and it doesn't really have an emotional feeling of what I should do, how I should behave. So uh, um, the teacher's role, the trouble is a teacher has 30 students, they can't get become the best friend to each one of them. I thought for a while that computers were going to make a difference in schooling. And oh my gosh, every student could go in their own preferred directions with computers. Mm, that didn't work out. So then the time of the book Singularity came out, I said, oh my gosh, computers are going to have feelings. They're going to be you know, cognizant. They're going to be sentient. And they're going to look at your face and understand you and be your best friend. And then the teacher could take your interest. My interest is chemistry. Minus physics, minus math, minus, minus uh, history, and could take you in your preferred direction. Each of 30 students has a low cost teacher called a computer. And, um, and that never really happened. I thought that, oh, that you, if you were interested in chemistry in second grade, you could get up through all of university chemistry in a couple of years with a teacher that knew everything and told all the right jokes and knew you and was your best friend. But that hasn't happened, and it's not going to happen with where we are today with AI. AI never sits down and says, what should I do different? What should I do better? A hu human mind still has that intuitive level, uh, can feel things that other human mm -hmm. beings feel. And that's so yeah. important. I love hearing about you building computers. And right before coming in here, I met a young man who's building computers himself at home. <coughs> and then I asked his name, and I kid you not, his name is Macintosh. With Macintosh as your inspiration, what advice would you give to our teachers yeah. to fuel his innovation and his creativity and motivation so well, that he achieves? Recognize that 
it might not have to do with school and tests and all mm -hmm. that. What you're trained as a teacher to, to do and give and, and expected by your principals and, and the superintendents. No, just spot somebody's doing something on their own. Usually they are a maker, not academically that intelligent. In teaching computers for eight years, I found that students did really well if they were, the teachers considered them low academic levels in the academic sphere. And if they were high academically, they didn't do as well in the computers. They didn't want to want it to be a part of their life. But look for things they're doing outside of school. Mm -hmm. That's what I was doing outside of school. Never got noticed, but I was so shy it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I just got better and better and better at it. Work and work and work at what you love and don't let people stop you. You got the internet today. Back then it was a little difficult to go to libraries. No, yeah. I was so shy, I was very strange and people would say things like, what's his problem? <laughs> so I went down to Sunnyvale <laughs> Library and got every book I could on psychology and started reading them. Found out, oh, I didn't have any psychological problems. <laughs> <laughs> pivot a little and start asking you some more explicit questions about AI. Um, Isaac Asimov came up with the three laws of robotics. And the purpose of those was to maximize the innovation of robotics, but to minimize the collateral damage of robotics, to protect humans from robots. Have you given any thought about any guidelines or guardrails for AI that might help us to leverage AI for teaching and learning or being productive in society while also minimizing collateral damage? Because people are on- I've given it a lot of thought because, well, with AI, we hear a lot of stories about deep fakes and informa mm -hmm. wrong information, hallucinations and all that. My biggest principle in life is you want to be a good person and do good for others. And the apex of it all is be truthful. Never say things that, oh, somebody could find out that's not true. Um, that'd be too embarrassing for, for me my whole life. So I put truth first. And then you have these cases where AI is not only truthful, but unreliable. I mean, we aren't skeptical enough. And especially with uh, generative AI and chat GPT, and you can get a whole beautiful document written and it's just so full, but it still doesn't have that emotional content like it came from a human thinking, the student thinking. And the best way is, you know, if you can be one-on-one -on -one with a student and have interview interviews instead of uh, just multiple choice tests, you know, you find out if the person knows it or not. They can submit a great paper, you know, from ChatGPT. There's a professor in um, Nashville, um, and he, he allows AI reports to come from the students. Everyone's AI just passed on. He never given a higher than a C plus. That's all they're worth. I mean, when you understand something, you know how to make it concise, say the right words, and carry an emotional meaning. Even if you're making a pitch to a boss at work, you kind of know what will go over why, what are the good things, and AI just doesn't know these little human constructs of the mm -hmm. world. So, um, you know, AI can be good. I look at it as a reporter. Right now, okay, you want to get some information on something, you go to a search engine, type in some terms. And if you go to... Um, you go to ChatGPT, you'll get back, you know, a flood of information, which is, you know, more than you could say yourself. You should learn it. So you could repeat it yourself or repeat the, the important concepts in a paragraph that you wrote yourself. That's real thinking. You know, we talk about knowledge versus thinking. And uh, the role of the teacher should still be to make sure that thinking mm -hmm. is happening and not just able to pass on information. I, I love that, and, and we were talking about that earlier, that the role of the teacher is shifting. Um, we're no longer relying upon the teacher for all of our information, and so the emphasis has changed. We're focusing on teaching thinking, teaching ethics, teaching critical, critical thinking and problem yeah. solving. Are you thinking as a person, consider that of a life skill. Mm -hmm. You're here at yes. HPU. Premier Life Skills University, High Point University. I, That's I what recommend we focus on High Point here. University over all other universities to anyone I run into. Can I get that? I do that all the time. Tape? That's true, just Are totally we getting true. that on tape? Yeah. <laughs> Purple and Panthers and uh, no, ever since ever since I uh, came on board here, that's been my feeling. Yeah. I've even recommended it to relatives. But I mean, it I, really I, is. the thing is, what is school? Um, I, I recently gave a commencement speech at Berkeley, and my third time giving one there. And I referred to Corey Hall, I learned about machines. Well, that was the engineering department. And Tolman Hall, 
I learned about people. That was psychology back then. Tolman Hall doesn't exist anymore. And Norton Hall, my dorm, that's where I learned about life. That's life skills. Mm -hmm. How to deal with people and what you really love in life and finding it. College is, um, is one of the most important times, so is high school, because you have the greatest intellectual um, strength and the greatest physical strength. You can stay up late to study things. And I found, my gosh, my first year of college, I could get a job washing dishes in a girl's dorm, and then I could go with my little money and to the university bookstore, and there were courses on strange computer languages. I could just buy manuals, or I could read them in the, in the uh, bookstore. My gosh, you know. If you really know what your passion is, follow it. You know, that's where you, that's, um, but the amount of time you put in, you know, the love of, drives you that way. If you say, I just want to get through school, that's a pretty low, lit, low bar. Mm -hmm. You have the unique experience of following this arc of innovation, um, putting PCs in the homes all across America and seeing the excitement growing then seeing the productivity and the usage and application of those PCs continuing to increase. And nowadays, I mean, you can't go anywhere without a computer in your pocket, on your desk, in your car. Looking at that arc of innovation, do you see AI following a similar arc? And if so, what do you predict that we can anticipate in the next 10 or 20 years? Sure. Well, every step of technology that we had something we didn't have before, I was not a follower, actually. I was a very much a leader, um, and uh, some accidental reasons for that. But um, every step we took with a new piece of technology didn't exist before, you know, and we got up to usually in interface, you know, starting out with a keyboard. Then we went to a mouse where you could point at things that you saw in two dimensions like a real human. The human has to be more important than the technology. That means put the work into the technology so it works in a human way, and it's intuitive, and what you think will work will work. Well, those were a long time ago. That was a long time ago when the, the mouse got introduced by uh, Apple with the Lisa computer and then the Macintosh. But uh, it was really true then. And every time we have a new technology, oh, touch screens, for example, it's like it takes us to where that becomes a very common thing that you have to be used to. And now we have AI, and we'll have to include AI in our lives. And it's just another one of these many steps. And it did never just never diminishes the human. The human should still be, every way I think, should always be more important than the technology. Put a lot of work into the technology to make it work the human ways, rather than the human putting work in to figure out how the technology works. Mm -hmm. Have there in the past few years been learning technologies that you've come across in your work that have been aha moments for you? Like, wow, we should have one of these in every school, or let's get these in the hands of every student. Anything that's impressed you or wowed you? It's usually what's happening, you know, the leading edge of it. And eventually, it just becomes commonplace, and every school has its computer lab. Mm -hmm. I remember going through wired schools where you start, that used to be the thing. There's, there's a level of technology, and that's just the level you're at. And how do you how do you get the most out of it? Mm -hmm. And uh, no easy answer. There's no one answer because right. you get into budgets and money. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Waz, for coming to High Point University again and again to inspire us and for I, sitting I down so, and spending time with us today. I'm so proud to tell people I'm innovator in residence at High Point University. We love it. We love it. Yeah. Thank you all very much for visiting our campus today and being part of our High Point family. Yeah.